Christy Lou Who. <laughs> it's all you, babe. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to try very hard to transition into narrator lady now. Ah, okay. So I'm going to be narrating tonight from <laughs> Colorado <laughs> Treasure by Dorinda Babcock, who has absolutely nothing to do with that Tony, but has everything to do with Antonio Morales, who I rather love. He is a wonderful character. And Victoria Silverthorne. Now, just to set this scene up a little bit for you, um, Victoria has been living in Denver with her very wealthy uncle and aunt. She is there because um, the whole story, the first two-thirds of it, is shrouded in mystery. She is 20, and for 15 years she's been an orphan. Her parents died in a tragic mining accident. She was five. She doesn't remember why they were there. She doesn't even know exactly where it was. She's heard rumors that they were looking for Spanish gold, but they were very strong Christians, and nothing she's hearing is lining up. It doesn't make any sense to her. And she's been now for four months. She's been in Denver. And she's very frustrated because she doesn't know what the future holds, and she hasn't found any answers. And so right now, she is praying aloud. So that's where we're going to start. Lord, please show me what I'm to do. I'm so confused and uncomfortable when I think about my future. You know how much I hate this feeling of not knowing. But I know you hold my life in the palm of your hand. You know the beginning and ending of my story. Help me to trust your judgment and to remember you love me. Please show me your will. An hour later, feeling warm and soothed, Victoria descended the carpeted stairs and glanced out the window at the mid-morning sun. As she reached the bottom stair, someone rapped the door knocker, and George opened the door. Astonishment stopped her in her tracks. There stood Tony, twisting his hat between his hands and wearing his special occasion black cowboy boots, black slacks, black jacket, white shirt, and black string tie. Though his face appeared tranquil, she sensed he was poised to move quickly. He stared at her, and the look in his rich brown eyes could only be described as hungry. Her heart about exploded at the sight of him. Tony! She raced the few feet to the door and flung herself into his arms. I'm so glad to see you! He held her close and inhaled. Cariño mio! He breathed near her ear. Hermosa. He held her for several moments. Victoria rested her cheek against his chest, closed her eyes, and listened to the rapid beat of his heart. When she remembered where she was, she opened her eyes and slid her palms down Tony's chest until she found his hands. She linked her fingers with his and said, Come in. She tugged at him, but as she turned, she caught sight of Hercules and Dorado standing on the side lawn munching on the grass near the drive. Both horses were saddled, and Tony had again woven green ribbons into Dorado's mane. You brought Dorado? Oh, Tony, thank you. Tony smiled and kissed the fingertips of one of her hands. See, si. he has missed you mightily, cariño. Perhaps you should say hello to him. Victoria called to the horse as she walked toward him. He lifted his head and pointed his ears at her. The horse stood ground-hitched as he had been trained, but whinnied and pawed the ground when he heard her voice. She rubbed his velvety nose and scratched around his ears and eyes as she spoke to the gelding. Hey, big boy, I sure have missed you. The horse nickered and sniffed her hair and face. She put her arms around the big horse's neck and leaned her cheek against his. Tony stood beside her and watched, stroking the Palomino's flank as she talked to Dorado. The beauty of your voice soothes my spirit, Victoria. These last four months have been muy difícil. Dorado is not the only one who has missed you mightily. Victoria turned toward him, tears in her eyes. I know, Tony. He brushed away the droplets. When Hercules blew, they looked toward the house. Tim approached as if mesmerized, and Cookie, George, and Aunt Bella watched from the doorway. Victoria signed and spoke. Come and meet Dorado. His name means golden in Spanish. Tim stopped beside Dorado, but did not touch him. His eyes remained glued on the horses until he finally looked to Victoria for reassurance. <coughs> Excuse me. You can touch him. Hold your hand flat like this so he can smell you. 
Tim's smile caused Victoria's heart to swell as the boy began to softly stroke the horse's neck. Dorado nudged him for more scratching, and Hercules pushed his head into the circle for attention. They like to be scratched here and here, Victoria demonstrated to allow him to copy her motions. Her hands would smell of horse, but she didn't care. They will be your slaves forever if you'll just stand here and scratch them for a while. Tim made a soft, gurgling sound indicative of his pleasure. As he petted the horses, his eyes slid to Tony and then to Victoria. This is Tony. He came all the way from Texas to bring Dorado to me. She looked at Tony. Tony, this is my friend Tim. His mother is the cook here. Tim and Tony sized each other up. Then Tony held out his hand to the young man. Tim looked at him intently, then shook his hand. Mucho gusto. Tony seemed to know instinctively to look at Tim when he spoke and not at Victoria, though she signed Tony's words. She recognized the touch of hero worship in Tim's eyes as he gazed at Tony. Tony, the dark, handsome, athletic man who rode horses and lived on the ranch Tim had heard so much about. And now the man of the tales stood before him in flesh and blood. Beautiful horses. Tim signed and pointed, and Victoria translated, Yes, and I came to see if the very beautiful lady would like to ride her very beautiful horse. Victoria laughed. <laughs> I'd love to. Give me time to change. I'll let Aunt Bella know our plans. Would you like to stay with the horses, amigo, until we return? Tony waited for Victoria to interpret. No one would mistake Tim's enthusiastic answer. Both Bella and Cookie appeared to be taken with Tony. Who wouldn't be? Victoria grinned. He was soft-spoken and charming. His quiet assurance and controlled movements must have convinced the two they need not worry about her safety while she was with him. Please return for dinner this evening at seven, Mr. Morales. I'm sure my brother would like to meet you. I will be honored. Thank you. Victoria rushed into her split riding skirt and jacket. She adjusted the lace at her neck and wrists before she slipped on her low-heeled, black leather riding boots. Then she set her wide-brimmed, gray felt hat firmly on her head. She descended the stairs, riding gloves in one hand and a small set of silver spurs in the other as Tony, Cookie, and Bella watched her. At the bottom of the stairs, she handed Tony her gloves while she bent to buckle on the spurs. We'll be gone a while, Auntie. I want to show Tony some of the sights. She observed the concern in both women's eyes. Don't worry, I'll be okay. I'm safe with him. Victoria determined to give Tim a ride soon after she saw longing in his eyes as he watched them mount. The sheer joy of being on the back of a horse and riding in the warm spring sunshine with Tony brought color to her cheeks. She felt like racing Dorado down the streets of Capitol Hill. Tony easily interpreted her feelings. Not here. Not yet, senorita. A stretch of ground a few miles away will suit our purposes per perfectly. This time, cariño, we will have a fair race, no? Victoria's full-throated laugh was contagious. Excuse me. I have missed you, pequeña. His voice caressed her. As they approached an open, park-like area a few miles from Capitol Hill, Tony pointed. When we pass the first tree in that line of trees, we will race for a quarter mile to the end of the grove. Agreed? Yes. Victoria laughed once more as they approached the tree. Ready? Go! Tony yelled. They each touched the sides of their horses with the spurs, and both horses laid their ears back, bunched the muscles in their powerful front and hind quarters, and then stretched their necks out to run. Victoria leaned forward and low over Dorado's neck and used her inner thighs and stirrups to balance. Run, Dorado, run! Her breath came in short gasps. Tony whooped. The pounding of the hooves on hard ground matched the pounding in Victoria's heart. Her hair came loose from the pins and whirled and danced around her as she and Tony raced neck and neck, but she didn't care. She hoped the strands would stay out of her eyes long enough for her to see Dorado's nose past the finish line. Who won the horse race? <laughs> well, it just so happens Colorado Treasure is available wherever you buy books. <laughs> nice one. Good job. Thank you. I love that part. That's my favorite part in the whole story when Tony shows up. Love it. And says, I see Dorinda. Hello. Yeah, you want me to bring her on? 
I do. All right, Dorinda, can you hear us? Yes. All right, yeah. good. Hello, let hello. Let me uh, make some uh, volume adjustments, and we'll bring you on camera here in a second. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I rather love these two. I'm going to be sad when I have to bid them farewell. All right, there <laughs> she is, kids. Dorinda Babcock Dorinda on the camera Babcock. for you. Babcock, Arthur, Hi. Arthur Extraordinaire. Yes, ma'am. We are job, so Christy. psyched. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, I am so going to miss these two. I haven't They'll told be back. <laughs> they will be. And Tim, too, right? Tim's coming back? Yes, yes. I love Tim. I love Tim. I, I know that you are, Dorinda is just a renaissance woman. She knows so many things, but languages is one of the things that she really uh, stands apart. I mean, you did so much research on sign language for this book, didn't you? Yes. Oh, my goodness. I have loved it, and I, I kind of almost wish that I, I knew it because the fluidity of it and the um, just... Tim is such a special character. Um, if you didn't pick up on it from the, I'm sure you did, but he, Tim is deaf. And Victoria learns signs. And, and one thing I learned from this is you were saying that Spanish syntax and American Sign Language are similar. That blew me away. I had no idea. <laughs> so, all right. So we have, um, you know, you're, you're a born storyteller. Tell me first how many novels you've written. Let's see, five, six, seven, eight, eight are published and nine, 10 and 11 come out within the next two years. Uh-huh. And she also has what? You've sent me a novella and she showed me two books in progress when we were at Elk Lake. So um, she, you could say she's prolific. I mean, I think that's an understatement. Oh my goodness. So what attracts you to storytelling? Well, I think it's what attracts most people. It's the ability of words to transport us to different places and time periods. And through storytelling, I can learn and grow with the characters as they encounter, you know, their real life problems or learn how to function in a past era if it's the time travel. Yes, absolutely. Uh, series. And, you know, what I enjoy in a well-written story is what I try and put into my novels and my stories, and I hope that attracts the readers and the listeners for the audiobooks to my stories. So it's kind of the golden rule of writing. That's pretty brilliant, ma'am. I like that. <laughs> what attracts you to the story is what you want to bring. I like that very much. Well, I, forgive me, I cannot help myself. I have to bring up the Jindentors. If you're going to be talking about about uh you know the the idea of transporting somebody this book i mean honestly it i was so hooked on it i could hardly you know you hear people say oh i couldn't put it down blah blah, blah. i'm telling you i was thinking about it constantly i was so obsessed with these characters i mean it was it's crazy this book is so brilliant and i know you told me that you were thinking about what you would take with you if you went back in time, right? Was that the original thought? Right. The premise for that book is what if some Christian soldiers, some families survived a nuclear war in the future and they found a way to go back in time and they chose the middle 14th century? What would they take with them knowing they would never come back to the future? And what would they how would they set up their society so that they might be able to prevent something like that in the future? Mm -hmm. And then more importantly to me, because culture has always influenced how I had to think with so many students from different cultures is how did they interact with the cultures around them mm -hmm. coming from the 21st century or whenever, mm -hmm. and they're back in the 14th century. So how would they interact? How successful would they be? What kind of modifications would they have to make since there's no plastic then, mm -hmm. there's no electronics, there's no electricity. So how would they survive? And so, and so this, things, that yeah. Jindentors takes place four generations later. And then that would be, how does it impact their descendants? Mm -hmm. And you brought with it your wealth of knowledge about things like plants and essential oils and trigger points and massage therapy and oh my goodness I I I, I just have learned so much and and you you were very careful about what you chose to include as 
essentials for the firsts, right? That's what you called the generation that went back in time, the firsts? Yes. Yes. Okay. So at the back of the book, I think this is this shows how much integrity she has as an author. She talks about the books that she, or maybe it's at the beginning, that she consults um, for this. And here it is. Yeah. When, what a writing journey the Jindantors took me on. Though the book is a fantasy, I researched many topics to make this story believable. I gained insights and tools to make my life better. I love that. And she doesn't hoard her knowledge. She didn't say so yet, but I'm going to. Jorinda teaches English as a second language. And she is such a born teacher and student. And she passes this on. So she looks at a time, the Time Traveler's Guide to Medieval England, Life in a Medieval Village, the DMSO Handbook, Medicinal Plants for the Mountain West, of the Mountain West, Edible Wild Plants, Growing Herbs 101. She has all these things. And I picked up something. I can't help but tell them about Minta Oil. Please do tell about Minta Oil, ma'am. <laughs> well, in the Jim Dem tours, the Minta Oil is actually essential oil of peppermint. And... My husband and I use this all the time for a lot of different things, but my publisher said, no, that sounds too modern. So figure out a way of, of saying it differently. So I just cut off part of it and added a letter. And so now peppermint essential oil became mental oil. And um, the osmata oil, if you check out some of the research on uh, DMSO, which is dimethyl sulfoxide, We've used that for years for different things. And it's an amazing, amazing product. And the silver so, water. <laughs> the silver water is the pure colloidal silver. There are three types of colloidal silver. Two of them, if you take too much of it, can make you blue. Yeah. But pure colloidal silver doesn't. We've used it for years. Yeah. So. Did you say make you uh, blue? Yeah, blue. Yeah. Like as in the color blue? Yes. Yes, yeah. it's very it's very toxic. You have to be so careful. Oh, I didn't mean to well, it's interrupt. Like, it's sounds, like chromium. Cool. No, it's like chromium. Um, I remember on Aaron Brockovich, there's like two or three different kinds of chromium. One of them is something you can get at GNC, and one of them will kill you. So yeah. you, you have to know your stuff. You don't just start taking stuff. you got to know. And yeah. Kina, the main character, this gorgeous redhead, you can't see it, but um, she is very intelligent healer, and she knows all about all these plants and and everything and diet, all different kinds of things to make you healthy. And it's it's just it's so subtle. What I loved about it is so subtle. But I, I did not have a subtle hip pain in, at the end of April. I mean, I was I was on <laughs> fire and um, I was messaging Dorinda. She was preparing to go on a trip that she just got back from a research trip. And I, I mean, I was about in tears. Over, and she goes, Christy, rub some peppermint oil onto your back. Just mix it up with some, you know, whatever massage oil you happen to have. And I did, and it was the first relief I had had in like two weeks. Wouldn't you know my chiropractor decided to take that whole week off and I was dying. <laughs> and, oh, just God bless you because, oh my goodness. But but tell me about your research trip that you just took and your research, um, your passion and your motivation for that because you're all in, girl. Well, I wanted to do this particular research trip for several years, but things didn't work out until just recently. And so the next book in the Treasure of the Heart series that follows Colorado Treasure is Trouble in Texas. And the third book is The Prodigal Returns. And so in Trouble in Texas, when um, the main character returns, when Victoria returns to the Amarillo, Texas area, of course, she's facing a lot of problems because of her differences. And she married a man whose mother is Anglo and his dad is Mexican. And that wasn't done in Texas at that time, not very well and not accepted. So she faces a lot of uh, trials that way. But I wanted to get a feel for the area. I'd been through there several times. So my husband and I took a quick trip and stayed in Canyon, Texas, um, where the largest historical museum in Texas is. It's the Panhandle Plains Museum. It's fabulous and worth the trip. So we spent a few hours there looking at the exhibit, taking pictures. And the next morning we rented some horses and went on a ride into the Palo Duro Canyon. And I was able to get some pictures and talk to some of the people who owned land there in 1960s. And I hope to get to see Charles Goodnight's ranch, but we didn't have the time to do that. Mm -hmm. So 
He had a ranch in the Palo Duro Canyon too. So it was a research trip to really get a sense of what is the landscape like, what plants, what are the geological formations there? Because I do a lot of research, whether it's speculative or historical, and just to make sure that people who haven't been there can get a sense of what it's like, much like the chapter that makes you sick in my book, where they're going over Red Mountain Pass <laughs> in Colorado, which is still one of the most dangerous passes in Colorado to date. So it's just to get that authenticity uh, is, you know, the purpose of the trip for that. Now, any aspiring authors take notes on that? <laughs> because if you really want to write fiction, to me, a good writer is going to make it seem as though you don't even need to consult the history books. You can just go with what Dorinda says. The hands-on <laughs> research, the willingness to invest in travel costs, willingness to read books, and then you go and write. That is what a real professional does. There's a lot of work. It's not just sitting at your at your keyboard, unless, of course, somehow you're writing your own story, you know, your own memoir or whatever. But you got to have a name before you do that, right? So, holy cow! I mean, that is so impressive to me. And um, and you know, one of the things I've loved about working with you, not just your wealth of knowledge about languages and things like that, but also the willingness that you had to share pictures with me, um, and and especially. Oh, my goodness. Red Mountain Pass. The, the woman writes, this is how well Dorinda writes. I'm sitting in my studio. I live in, in Pennsylvania. Not exactly mountainous. There's some hills. And I'm, I'm experiencing vertigo because it was so intense, this scene where, where Victoria is, is going around. And this, she sent me an, in a 19th century photo. The pass seriously is carved out of the side of a mountain with a sheer drop off. And it looks like the path is about eight or 10 feet wide. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I would be like scraping my body around that thing, let alone being on a horse. I could hardly get through it. And then wouldn't you know, wouldn't you know, it failed the floor noise test. <laughs> and I had to do it all over again. So it was brutal. He told me, he's like, I'm like, which chapter did you say? Which chapter did you say? <laughs> oh my gosh. But I got through it and it passed this time around. Thank yes. God. Well, I think the research part for me, because I enjoy the research, you know, as 25 years as an English as a second language teacher, you had to figure things out. Mm -hmm. And I know that for historical readers, even though they know they're reading fiction, they want it to be accurate yes. so when i was doing the first book in the destiny series dodging destiny i needed a fourth of july celebration to be on a saturday so i'm saying please 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 let july 4th 1857 be a saturday <laughs> and it was <gasps> oh. there are people who will if i say the moon was full they will go and look oh, yeah. at a moon a calendar to see in 1857 on July 4th what was the phase of the moon yep and then in one portion of this in the third book which is uh following destiny she finds out she's related to these people that she met in the past this is another time travel speculative and so what I had to do was create a spreadsheet and trace her lineage back just for my benefit. <laughs> Lo and behold, I get a letter from a reader in Grand Junction, Colorado saying, well, my friend and I have figured out her ancestry all the way back to the twins and who were their parents? And oh I still, goodness. I mentioned it just in passing. So there are people who are very interested in that mm -hmm. and want to know and then just one more thing on the research thing with victoria on colorado treasure is she's having to travel from pueblo colorado over the mountains to montrose mm -hmm. well they had to ride a train and the trains were really running a lot because the mines were booming at that time and the conductor tells them a story 
of the ghosts, uh, mm -hmm. the ghost train of Marshall Pass. And I researched and read and read and read that. It took me a while, but it only took up like a few passages, yes. you know, paragraphs. So research to me is very important. I enjoy doing it because I learn from it. And then I try and figure out a way to integrate that into the stories in an organic way. And it does seem so natural, you know, she's riding the train and she's hearing, you know, okay. And she's, you know, she's hearing this conductor tell this story that's just about making her lose it. I mean, she's already got altitude sickness and now she's hearing this story and oh my gosh, Brett needs yeah. to interject something. Uh, just something technical. Okay. I had forgotten to enable screen share and, um, I've, you know, the tech nightmares I've been having, yes. since, but they're all good now. I'm working on one minor issue, but I checked my messages and she's like, is screen sharing on? And I'm like, ah! <laughs> let her, just let her know it's on if she wants it's to use on, it now. Screen sharing's on now, Dorinda. Okay. So um, you're also a cover designer. And, you know, I keep holding up these books. I don't know how visible they are, but Brett had them on the, um, on the show earlier. And they are just absolutely stunning. And... I know you have to layer pictures. Now tell me how that process works. Well, let me go ahead and share my screen with some of our authors' books, but I'll explain it to you first. So if an author sends a proposal to Elk Lake and the proposal is accepted, they're sent a packet of information that includes a cover request form. And they get that back to us. And when their book is closer to time, um, I'll look at that. They're, the managing editors usually send a, an email to me, including the author in there, and introduce us. And then I have them do certain things. One of it is I need you to go to our stock site because we use stock photos. We don't have the capacity for photo shoots at this time. So you need to go and find what best captures you know, the, the, the conflict in your story or the main idea of your story, because I don't have time to read the books. I wish I could, but I can only go based on the information that Deb Haggerty gives me or the author gives me. So they help me by going and doing that. And then we have layers. So let me call up a Photoshop file, a couple of them. So I'll share my mm -hmm. screen. This is one of Andrew Roth's books that I did for him a while back. And can you take a guess at how many images? I think you already know, but I, won't can guess. You guess <laughs> I do know <laughs> how many images this took. Erica, I'm calling on you. You you answer or or Will, one of you, or mom answer. My my mom was a teacher for 33 years. We'll put it on Mrs. Moore. Yeah, Mrs. Anybody? Moore, it's your turn. <laughs> Anybody Raise your hand. in the comments if you want to answer the question. And the question is, how many layers? How many images did it take uh, to make? How this? many images did I have to use to get the concept? Yes. All right. We'll anybody want to we... guess in the comments? Anybody? If you win, we'll give you absolutely nothing. <laughs> no, we'll give you a bright smile and maybe an <laughs> improv song or something. <laughs> Nobody brave enough to comment yet. Did we, did we have someone get close? Nobody's, Nobody's guessed yet. Every, everybody's they're all being too quiet. Chicken. Yeah, they're being quiet. All right. Well, this took six images. That's amazing. To create this cover. So the girl was an image. The guy was an image. The greenery here was an image. The forest was an image. The train track was an image. And I actually, because this girl was not dressed in a historical costume, I actually had to photograph a real dress and put it on her and so she has many, this picture has many layers and i'll take you here in just a moment to show you once these are composited i put them in InDesign and create the cover spread so i want to show you another one rebecca price janney's last book that she did is east in a christmas tide and this one took seven images to create this that is so gorgeous. I just love that. It's so, that is such an attractive cover. I don't care. You know, we all do judge books by their cover. So, brava. 
And so just as part of the process, I have the canvas sized at what I need it to drop it in to a book that will be trimmed six by nine. And if you can see over here on the right hand side, this shows me the layers. So I can turn layers off to see what this looks like and I can work on the layers individually. That's so, cool. you know, I can turn off the paper. I can, I can turn off these layers and you know, the lightness or any of the adjustment layers that I put so on there. So that's hers. And then let's go over to. Hey, we did have some guesses on that number earlier that came in. I forgot there's like a 20 second delay from when we asked to when I get the call. Oh, right? Okay, I'll wait a little longer. No, 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 no. So you had said six. Uh, the closest that they got, everybody guessed five. Uh -huh. uh, Erica Marie Hogan guessed four or five. Dennis Conrad uh -huh. guessed five. And Rosalva Alvarado guessed five. All so right. they were very close. Okay, so let me just pause here for a moment, okay? Rosa is the lady who taught me the Mexican accent. And Rosa is such a gift from God to me because I didn't think that I had what it took to do this book. And Dorinda had said she didn't think she'd ever be able to get this book on audio. We're talking about Colorado Treasure now. Um, because she wanted someone with an authentic accent. And so God, through my mom and through her church, led me to Rosa. And so I am so grateful that you're here and so grateful. She read about six pages for me, and that's a lot. And I listened to it for about two months um, before I felt confident enough to send in a real accent sample, and it passed Dorinda. So thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Okay, you can go yeah. back to the thing now. <laughs> So here is one that one of our talented freelancers who will do covers for us um, periodically. This is Jeff Gifford's cover for Faith Weaver's uh, Create Your Own Quest novel. Her first book um, I did, and then Jeff did this one. So take a guess, and I'll wait a little longer. <laughs> How many images do you think this cover took? Okay, kids, we're looking at Once Upon a Time, the, the once upon the shadows. Once upon the shadows. I should have my glasses on. <laughs> we want to know the image you're seeing on your screen right now. We want to know how many layers do you think this one took? The last correct answer was six. And we'll let you finish. You got some more to talk about on this, right, Dorinda? Uh-huh, I All do. Right. So we'll wait till you're finished with this explanation until we give the answer away because that's about how long okay. it'll take the comment. So you guys okay. had guessed, and you guys that didn't get the guts up to guess. The, you, you that did, Just take you were guess. so glad close on the last one go ahead and guess on this one you might get it right how many layers <laughs> oh you lost the screen share yeah i know i'm switching there oh see. sorry now i thought I'm it was my i'm so hey look don't teach the teacher i know but i'm like i'm like i'm like tech glitchy right now because of what happened earlier and so i'm like i'm jumpy i'm just oh no <laughs> well he teaches on uh, zoom also he teaches guitar lessons so but yeah i yeah. how did you learn about indesign and did you take a course? Well, I, I had finished my master's degree already. And then as I was getting close to end of retirement, I really wanted to do design work for Christian authors, for a Christian publisher. And I graduate, well, I, my senior portfolio, I presented May of 2017. And at that time, Deb, Deb Haggerty and I were chatting in email. And somehow she said, well, do you know how to use InDesign? I said, I use Adobe InDesign and Photoshop every day. And I sent her my unfinished portfolio. And the next email was, do you want a job? Mm -hmm. I said, doing what? She said, creating covers, formatting the interiors, and creating the ebooks for our authors. I said, well, that's what, why I went to school. So I guess I do. <laughs> so that's how we started. And I've been working with Deb and doing freelance since May of 2017. And by the end of November of this publication year, I will be up close to 600 books. So for our Christian authors. Uh, that is a thumbs lot. up and hearts, people. If you like her covers, holy cow. Thumbs up and hearts. I think we should see like fireworks of, of both going on. <laughs> they well, are I just gorgeous. wanted to finish showing you this. So you saw Andy's cover. 
and the layers that went in there. And so I exported as a CMYK JPEG, which don't worry about that. It means cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which is a four color process for printing and created the cover and back cover. <laughs> and then this is the what I do when everything's ready. I get the files ready for upload to the distributors. So KDP, Amazon is one and Lightning Source is a trade distributor. So I get the files ready to go. So let me stop sharing that screen. And so those are the images and how I do it. They're just gorgeous. They're just Thanks. so attractive to the eye. And what I, another thing I really like about the Elk Lake books is they, they all have that nice glossy feel to them. I, to me, that's very appealing. Um, you know, I, I, I prefer a hardcover or a, a, a book to an ebook and but I will admit I do like audiobooks best of all. So <laughs> yeah. we hey, have we about we, three well, we minutes. Gotta, yeah we gotta go. We're gonna we're gonna jump off but before okay. we do we're gonna bring her back on the second feed. But before we do we had some guesses on uh, what was the name of that book? That one was Road to Laramie. No the Once other one that we were guessing the, the layers on. Oh say again Once Upon the Shadows. There we yes. go. Okay we had Chad Page guessed eight, Rosa guessed five, Dennis Conrad guessed seven, Courtney Smith guessed seven, and Erica says maybe seven. It's a gorgeous <laughs> cover. <laughs> Suck up. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Erica, Erica we love you. Erica would never be that. All right. So never. what is it? Tell us before we get you on the second feed. Six. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Nobody wins anything oh. tonight. <laughs> oh, All right, well. Dorinda, we're going to switch Zoom links. So I'm going to jump <laughs> you off for a minute. Christy's going to talk about a few things, and we'll set you back up in the other Zoom, okay? Perfect. <laughs> all right, we'll be we'll have you back in just a few moments. All right, Christy, it's all yours. All right, I'm going to do one tip, just one tip for uh, if you're interested in audiobooks and narrating. Um, one thing that I had to learn um, as I was going along is the importance of when they send you the manuscript, just transfer it, export it into a PDF if they send it to you in Microsoft Word. And then you have the ability to highlight, circle, erase, and add textual comments. I cannot overemphasize how much that adds to my ability to narrate effectively. Um, it is so important. Uh, right now, what I read to you, at two different points, I had written Tony because I wasn't when I was narrating, I kept thinking, oh, that's Tim, or oh, that's Victoria. Well, it's a problem if it's supposed to be a man with a Mexican accent, and I'm speaking a woman with a general American accent. That's a problem. So I need to have that, or I will highlight it or circle it. And uh, so that's something I can't overemphasize, and I will come back to that. But use, get it into the PDF form and use that toolbar so that you can make it easier on yourself. We'll All get right. back to that. Dorinda? Babcock interview yes, part two. Part two. <laughs> okay. So, um, aside from, uh, okay. So, so my next question is why did you want to get your books on audio? Well, I think that audio books bring that storytelling experience to a whole new level and to a whole new audience. The characters and places come to life through the narrator's voice and I just had my teenage granddaughter here and asked her, what do you want to do? Because we're geographically isolated. You can't just pop down and do this or do that. And I said, do you want to read? And she said, no, <laughs> I don't want to read. But for her, listening to audiobooks would be something acceptable. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, most of the time, if you have a good reader and you read to people, not just children, they much prefer that over having to do it themselves, especially oh, yeah. if they struggle with some, you know, the written word. Yes, yes. Yeah. So. Well, my son has ADHD and he hates to read. It's not that he can't read. It's that it's such a, a struggle to sit still and, and focus. And uh, when I had Will Inman on two weeks ago, he was talking about, you know, people have dyslexia and different challenges and reading is, is um, you know, it's tantamount to a punishment. And we don't want that as storytellers. You want it to, to transport them and to entertain and, and encourage. And, um, and I think audiobooks have that 
that power. Um, it's a totally different medium, but it's the same story. But there mm-hmm. is an element of, of breathing life into it when you get to hear a book as opposed to reading it. So I'm really glad that you see it that way. And I'm glad the next generation is seeing it that way as well because I think it's it's a really important venture, not just because I do it, but because it has been such an encouragement and, and a lifeline sometimes. I mean, when I drove to that conference to Elk Lake's family reunion, that was a 10 to 12 hour drive each way, depending on traffic. And I needed that audiobook to keep me focused. <laughs> you know, it's good stuff when you, when you need it. So I'm really glad you wanted to do it. Do audio. Um, okay. So tell me, uh, you bring some of your own experiences into your stories. I know that you do. Um, you know, how, how does that look? I mean, is it intentional or does it just kind of flow from who you are? Most of the time it's intentional, but because I know what I like and I know what I'm interested in and I know there are readers who would probably be interested in some of the thing, same things if they knew about them. So definitely I think authors bring their own experiences and parts of themselves to me in Colorado treasure. Uh, when Victoria is in Denver and she asks one of the maids, do they ever, does anyone here ever ask for pinto beans? And that, and they're horrified. No, you beans never do that. The, said, oh, green chilies taste wonderful. So <laughs> she when my mom something. read that, she said, that sounds just like you because mm-hmm. those are words I've often said, you know, green chilies would make this taste better. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so I think I do that. You know, I like to integrate the research and some of the learning. I'm still fascinated with plant medicine because God made plants as our pharmacopoeia before he ever created humans. And so they're there, they're powerful, and they do a lot without side effects of pharmaceutical drugs. And so you'll always see some form of that in my stories, as well as literacy. I worked with English as a second language students for 25 years, and my job was to teach them to listen, speak, read, and write in English mm-hmm. because literacy often opens doors of opportunity, Mm. especially if you're bilingual or trilingual. Mm. So that was my goal for 25 years. I still teach online during the academic year and I teach language arts because literacy is so important to me that you'll often see that thread or that theme throughout all of the books that I write, whether they're historical or speculative. And then another thing that's been very dear to my heart is the interaction of culture and language. You can't separate the two. Mm -hmm. So whatever language you're speaking, whatever your heart language is, culture is tied around that. And so with Colorado Treasure that you just read, that is kind of a compilation of 25 years of working with students who had a heart language other than English Mm -hmm. and just trying to show the respect for cultural and the difficulties of some of those things. So you will often see the language and the culture and the interaction between the two. So that would definitely be experiences that I bring, I bring to my stories. And if you wouldn't mind, we, we had a great conversation the other night prepping for this and you were telling a story of, um, walking, was it down the hall with some, some of your fellow classmates and speaking Spanish with them? I did my master's research. Uh, I did my master's degree program at Adams State College in Alamosa, Colorado, and that's in the San Luis Valley, where there are a lot of Hispanic people, Spanish speakers there. And it just drove home the idea that people, no matter what they think, they do have certain expectations. Mm -hmm. Um, There were two examples. This first one was when I was there. We were in these nice straight rows in this really boring classroom with no color in it. And the, a few handful of the Hispanic women sat at the back and they didn't interact much with us. And I sat at the front because the bathroom was there close. <laughs> and so one day they got up after class and were walking out and were speaking in Spanish. 
And so I spoke to them because I had my state endorsement in Spanish at the time when I still had my license. And I spoke to them and they were shocked and turned around. And then it was like ice melting. Mm -hmm. They were so friendly and so kind and invited me to go places with them and do things with them. And at that time, I've always been fascinated when bilingual speakers who know two or three languages fluently, when they choose to use a word from a different language in their conversation. So I always watched and listened for that and deliberately talked to them. And so I, I took their lead whenever we were talking about family and friends and social things, it was all Spanish. As soon as we start, started talking about academics and our degree program, it immediately switched to English. And so that just fascinated me throughout. And so when I went back to do my research project, I had some, a, a little girl from Mexico and she was sitting by herself at the table in the cafeteria. And so I walked up and in Spanish, I asked her, may I sit with you or have lunch with you? And she said, oh, teacher, sure. Mm -hmm. So I sit down and start talking to her. If I spoke to her in Spanish, she answered in Spanish. If I switched to English, she switched to English. And it was just so automatic and without any kind of thought. And then there was an example of one of my boys got in trouble and I was called down to the principal's office and he was so upset that when I asked him what happened, just this explosion of Spanish came out of his mouth and I was constantly telling him, calm down, calm down, it'll be okay, tell me what happened. Well, he did, but at that particular point in time with that emotionally charged situation, he forgot he even knew English as fluently as he did. And I've noticed students fluent in both languages. As soon as you're, you ask them to do calculations, most of them revert to their home language mm. to do calculations and math. Mm. And then just one other example, I was doing my student teaching uh, in New Mexico, and I was in a bilingual second grade. Well, at Christmas time, I went to get my hair cut, and I was sitting in the salon waiting my turn, and the Spanish-speaking lady came. She didn't speak English. The Hispanic lady who took her in and sat her in the chair um, said something to her, but I wasn't paying attention. And then this uh, hairstylist left, and she was gone for about 15 minutes, and I thought, well, that's kind of strange. So she comes back, and one of the Spanish-speaking professionals that we had, the classroom aides, in my section of the school came back with her mother. And she looked at me and said, how long have you been here? I said, well, I've been here probably 20 minutes. I'm waiting to get my hair cut. She said, this lady has been walking up and down the mall looking for anybody who looks like they might be able to speak Spanish. Uh -huh. And she turned to that stylist and said, why didn't you ask her? Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are certain expectations, mm -hmm. whether we admit it or not, that come with skin color. Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. But when I was ESL teacher and the liaison between the school and the parents for all of my students, I don't, you know, they didn't seem to think I had a skin color because I was just teacher. And so it was quite an experience. And that was very precious to me to see, you know, how language and culture interacted. Oh, Dorinda, you need to write an article called, they didn't think I had a skin color. <laughs> you do. Yeah, that yeah, that was 100%. funny. There was one student who finally had enough English skills to go into the regular English class. And the first day of school, he came shaking out of that English class. And he said, teacher, get me out of this class. Get me out of this class. And I said, well, your English is good enough. You can handle this. And he said, yeah, but the, I'm the only brown skinned person in there and everybody else has white skin. And I said, they're not going to eat you. Just give them a chance. So for two days, he asked me to get him out of there. The third day, he said not a word because some real pretty 
girls were surrounding him and I never heard, <laughs> please get me out of this class again. So, it's funny. <laughs> But I like the way you called um, the the young man you were talking to uh, earlier in the story, my boys, one of my boys. I love that. I love that because because real teachers will they'll refer to their my mom always said my kids. She always referred to her students of that year as my kids always. So yes. I, I totally get that. Well, you do have that that maternal way about you. And I think it I think it translates into your writing too because you get the sense that you really care about these characters. You know, they're real to you. And then that translates as a reader and as a narrator, they become real to us too. And mm -hmm. I um I haven't told you this yet, but I have officially wrapped Colorado Treasure and uh we're just we're just waiting now, now for it's all on the me. mastering <laughs> and the final edits. So I'm going to temporarily say goodbye, but not farewell to Tony and Victoria. But it's been a pleasure yes. narrating this book, and and uh, and what a what a beautiful story, and and all the research that you have done is just so so transparent in this, and it's just it's wonderful to read a book where you feel like you learn something and are entertained. So, our teacher, of course has produced a book where we're we're educated in an entertaining way and in a safe way you know we feel like we're loved too i just i just it's wonderful you're wonderful thank you so much for being here tonight thank and you it's been okay. such a pleasure we have some questions you. good yay questions are you ready to move to the q and a section? i am ready yes. all right kids it's time for the q and a section on part show books <laughs> uh we did that all right so if you uh well by the way dorinda i know you can't see me right at the moment but uh, really have enjoyed, uh, I get so enthralled mm. in all the information that uh, these authors have about different walks of life. Yeah. Not only their novels, but their skill and their, their personal lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just been wonderful having you on. I've really appreciated it. Uh, guys, mm -hmm. if you've enjoyed being on uh, or listening to uh, Dorinda and Christy interview uh, as much as I have, and you've got questions or you just want to say something, uh, light up the comments now. I'm going to start with... Uh, Elk Lake Publishing's own Travis Will Inman. He has a great question. Uh, he says, "Hi, Dorinda. Are there opportunities for other artists to join your team? I'm, I'm guessing on the graphic side of things, graphic art side of things. So, Dorinda. Yes, there are. And the the hard thing though about working for royalties uh, is you get three checks a year." So because of the contracts that the distributors have with our publisher, they don't pay for 60 to 90 days after. And most people aren't going to survive on a royalty kind of schedule. So we have a couple, uh, three freelancers who do mostly freelance work, but because Elk Lake has become so popular and we're releasing at least a hundred books a year, wow. it's hard for me to stay up with all the covers, especially when I teach. So the answer to that will is yes, if they're willing to work for royalties. And we have three right now, and it's helped me tremendously keep up. Um, I would think that would time. be a tremendous opportunity for someone looking to, to get some exposure and some potential income. Yeah. Uh, somebody, um, I don't know, maybe I'm way off base here, but thinking of uh, being an artist and an entertainer, yeah. I mean, when I was first getting started, I would look at, you know, a, a gig for, you know, not as much as I wish it would be. Yeah. As, okay, what are the benefits? How much exposure? Right. Who's going to be in the audience? Exactly. That kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah or, or somebody who is very successful in one avenue of life, but has always wanted to break into this avenue right. of life. And, you know, affords themselves some time on the side to do the freelancing. So if you're out there and that's you, uh, we can put you in touch with Dorinda or uh, anybody that can put you in touch with Dorinda. <laughs> and Elk Lake is nothing to see that. I mean, these authors, every practically every week, I'm seeing multiple authors getting awards. And I mean, like, big, big awards, like the Sela Awards. I mean, what, did they have 10? Is that right? 10? Yeah, so you're definitely going to get into That is very a, impressive. You would I definitely mean, be getting wow. into a company that was, that was yes, um, quality. Mover, filled with movers and shakers, Abs I would say. And just incredibly professional, talented yeah. authors. I mean, this is not like some kind of self-publishing, oh, you know, I'm willing to put up a couple grand and I have a book. No, these are the real deal. And these covers, you know, 
they do sell books to a point and you know you're making a difference these books have the potential to save lives because Jesus is always involved and so you know if that's something that motivates you you know I encourage you but it is very difficult if you don't have multiple streams of income and I appreciate your honesty on that Dorinda really do so Will if you're gonna if you have somebody in mind what they would need to do is contact Deb and myself and send samples of different styles of work that they could do and then if it meets what we need you know it's possible that they could get some of that but one of the other things they ought to consider if they're actual illustrators now jeff and and i tend we use stock photos and we composite stock photos like you saw but kelly is one of our authors kelly artieri and she's also an artist so for her book she's watercolor painting her images wow. but we often get children's authors we're interested in but one of the first questions we ask is do you have an illustrator because that's tough uh, children's books are costly to produce and some of them do some of them don't if they say well can you provide me with resources or people who may um, help me out here what I will do is show them samples of illustrations, different styles from illustrators that we've worked with, because illustrating is a whole different skill than compositing oh. in Photoshop. So if they're interested in children's picture books, you know, they would submit samples like that too. And typically they need to consider the time involved with that. So I tell them, if you think about it, you're going to need at least 16 interior images and a cover. And if illustrators work for $10 an hour, which they don't, uh, you're going to have five to six hours in each image. And most of them won't work for royalties because they have to pay their bills. Right. So if they have 50 to $60 or more invested in one of your images and you don't sell books, they get nothing. Exactly. So that's why it's hard doing it for royalties. But I do put uh, picture book authors in contact with whichever style, illustration style they want. Yes, and, and that's that's if great. They don't like it, they have to go and find their own. And then the style, if we haven't worked with that illustrator, we'd have to have samples. Oh, that's that's really good to know though, and that you're you're you know, sort of stopping that before they start, you know, understanding the difference between a children's book and and a and a another type. So what's the next question? Oh, we do have another question from Rosa. Rosa, yay. Rosa, Rosa asks, what is your work schedule like when you're writing? <laughs> that is an excellent question, Rosa. I don't know that I can give you a good answer because it depends on my schedule. So if you get the picture, I have to teach from August to the end of May. So I'm online from nine to noon with students. And when the hunting season starts, my husband and I have a game processing, a custom meat processing. So starting about September, which is um, archery season, going through muzzleloader season, through the rifle seasons, we may have the driveway lined up with hunters with animals in the back of their trucks waiting for us to process them. So I asked Deb, please don't put a bunch of books in September, October, November that I have to get designs out. So as far as my writing schedule, I think a lot in my head. I do a lot of the planning in my head. I ask questions of the characters. I think about the conflict. And when I'm writing, everything that goes in there has to be there for a reason. It can't be there because I like it. It has to move the plot along. So my writing schedule is in my head all the time. But then when I actually write, it's typically on the weekends when I can think and not have to do some design work. But it's whenever. So there's no answer. way a schedule of sit down every day and write 2000 words is going to ever work with me. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. But 
I think my schedule works all right because I have books coming out. Yeah, I think, I think you're doing and okay. darn good ones at that. I, I think you're doing all right, Dorinda. <laughs> I think yeah. creators always have to work around everything else. And I love that you're saying you're asking questions of your characters. Absolutely. I totally know what you're talking about. Well, yeah. Erica, yeah. you know what she's talking about, yeah. don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Erica will know about that. <laughs> for sure. so I, I have uh, one more. Okay. But it's a comment. One more comment. Because I'm rushing because we're going to lose her at 9.15. Oh, so. okay. All right. Well, actually, 9.25. Uh, anyway, um, Zorinda, a, a fellow by the name of Audrey Wyatt Shrive or Shreve. I'm not sure what, how to pronounce that. Do you Audrey, know? she, yes. Oh, I, I thought it was. There's a male picture there. I don't know <laughs> on her profile. That might be her husband. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, okay. So she. Uh, she uh -huh. said that those were amazing observations you were making. This was uh, towards the end of the interview. Uh, uh -huh. And then she said, I had to jump off, but she loved the interview and she loved uh, hearing how you do your research, Dorinda. So uh, uh -huh. that's awesome. There were a lot of people saying that they really enjoyed um, the interview uh -huh. and what Dorinda had to say. And good show so far. Uh -huh. Just one more, more thought on the research in yeah. the uh, Dodging Destiny series, the first book. Sure. Um, there is a portion of Oregon Trail and Civil War. Mm -hmm. So on the Oregon Trail, I read a bunch of primary source uh, diaries written by women who traveled the trail between certain years. So I thought, okay, I've got to organize this information. So I created a spreadsheet that when I printed it out, pasted it together, it was three eight and a half sheets wide by four long. And so I taped it to the side and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to organize this information? So I color coded each of the information from each woman and the columns, anytime they commented on plants or animals or conditions of the trail or uh, the Indians that were there or forts or whatever, I had a column for that. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking for patterns to see what did they all say? And so some of the situations that you see as they're traveling the Oregon Trail were actually situations that happened that these women mm -hmm. commented on. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that was the Civil War section. And I had two brothers fighting on different sides, one the Union, one the Confederacy, and a doctor fight, a Union doctor. And they all left for the war at different times. So I had to read a ton of Civil War information on generals and battles, trying to get these three guys on the same battlefield at the wow. same time. Woo! That is amazing. I did it, but it was oh, massive gosh. research. Wow. That is crazy. Oh my gosh. But you know what? That I, What I'm thinking of though, when you're doing that, like, when you're talking about that, is like almost like um, parsing a sentence. I can see the linguist in you, you know, compartmentalizing and then trying to make sense of it I, that makes sense that someone with your mindset would do it that way and it's brilliant because it does lend the authenticity and um i think that's awesome we have one more comment i believe oh uh, we did uh courtney smith says one of the best things about colorado treasure is the diversity of characters you nailed it oh yeah she did she did yes my, yes one of Thank my favorite courtney. things one of my favorite things about it is I, I've said this to you in person and Courtney may, I would love it if you would uh, let me know if you agree. Dorinda has the ability to get to the point in a conversation, in the dialogue. Um, there are no extraneous words. She, each word has emotion and has direction. You know, there are no chit chatty trait comments in there. And I, I think I think it's brilliant. And um, and one of my favorite things about this is the way that you emphasize that Tony and Victoria they do not communicate with each other effectively at all. And then they have a conversation where Victoria says, "This is how I want us to communicate," and they listen to each other, and you start to see their relationship improve. It doesn't, you know, overnight, but I think that's brilliant. You're wonderful that. I mean, well, I have to tell you, Courtney Smith is my daughter, and she is one of the most <laughs> requested children's picture book illustrators wow. with Elfland. Wow. And her two sons, my grandsons, are my students during the school year. I've oh. had them for language arts since kindergarten. Oh. So she's a sweetheart. Too. 
<laughs> well, thanks, Courtney. I <laughs> didn't realize that's she has talked right. about you, but I didn't know your last that's name. That's okay. <laughs> I feel kind of goofy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't feel goofy. I mean, it's that's good. Family's know. allowed to do that. That's what, you know, that's yeah, one of the great of course, things. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of people know she is because even though I'm mom, when she's working on projects with me, I'm Elk Lake senior graphics designer. And I may have to go to her and say, this isn't working for me. So we need to do this. Yeah. Or that, but it's kind of a back and forth. So it's a good does relationship. She look at you, does she look at you and go, oh, mom. <laughs> oh, occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, Dorinda, one of the things, another thing I love about you, and we're going to have to wrap this soon, but one of the things I love about you is, and I said this in my, my one bio write-up, um, there are no problems in Dorinda's world. It's just... Um, a quest to find the solution. I, I've, I've been talking to Dorinda and working exclusive, I mean, very, very closely. She's wonderful about responsiveness and everything and communicating, but it's like, there's never a problem. It's just, let's, let's find the right avenue to the solution. And so and I, think I told you a few times, breathe, Christy, just yes, take a breath yes, and breathe. Yes. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Yeah, I could really. A <laughs> oh. little bit, a little bit, because I'm pretty good at freaking out. <laughs> I've, I've often threatened to write a, uh, a resume and like my top of like bad, bad qualities. Number one would be I excel at tardiness and uh, panicking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I love your, you know, you never seem to be rattled too much, but then you also can't be bullied or pushed around. And so I'm sure that Miss Courtney has experienced that too. And, and that both as mom and senior graphic designer, you know, push Dorinda around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and one more thing. Do tell what kind of animals your husband and you process. Um, typical game animals, uh, elk, deer, bear, antelope, <laughs> moose. We did a zebra last year. A so, zebra? Oh, wait a but, minute. They don't I grow think, those in Colorado. No, it's not. I think it was imported to a big ranch in New Mexico. <laughs> Texas, you can't fool me. We'll get Texas hunters, and they'll bring their meat up to us to be processed. Wow. She has sent job, me pictures. So. She has sent me pictures. They really do process these animals. I mean, I'll around here, it. it's yeah. like hogs and deer and things like that. We're not doing any elk yeah. that are. She has a picture of her husband with with an elk, and it, the thing is so massive. Oh, oh they're huge. They're You've seen what Jr. Up the street does. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We have a. I have a neighbor that uh, was a Montana hunting guide, and uh, he goes out to Montana every year and Colorado. And brings home elk. I mean, he feeds his family of four yeah, for a year. pretty much off the land and off the, uh, you know, off harvesting JR's wild game. a mountain man. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. He and Sam well, would have been friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's our warning, kids. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being here, Dorinda. And praise God the storm didn't interfere. <laughs> It rained, and I was waiting for the crack of thunder and the dry lightning, but we don't hopefully have any wildfires going down. So. Yeah, that's, that's a big problem. Thank you. Heard. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, we were praying. I'm so relieved to hear that because we didn't want to lose you. This interview was right. too important. Well, thank right. you. Thank you. Have uh, a great night. Bye. Say hi to Dwight. Bye. <laughs>